in the screen. So, all right, 11th lecture. Um, tomorrow is the last lecture, actually, in the course. And usually I ask for your um, opinions on what we should talk about during the last lecture. So, um, if you have any interesting topics or questions, you can post them in Slack or email me and we can focus on these uh, things. Uh, okay, the sound is really weird. No, it's fine. Okay. Good. Um, so, uh, suggest topics for uh, tomorrow's lecture if you have something that you uh, think is confusing, uh, or things that we, you think we should dive deeper into. Also remember, um, deadline for the second workshop, final hand-in, was today at 12. I postponed it to tomorrow at 12, so you have some extra time. Um, probably not something you can use for anything useful, unless you have some really small details just to fix, but I will be out of the office uh, this afternoon, so I won't have any time to access to a computer, so I won't be able to uh, shut down the form anyway. So you have until tomorrow to hand in. Also, um, the online test, the online test test <laughs> uh, is uh, available for you to try. Follow the instructions. Uh, you should be able to get a password. You should be able to uh, try out the exam. If you haven't done so already, please do. Uh, the exam, of course, is just a mock exam. Uh, I think it's some old exam from from uh, some older course I had a few years ago, but actually the questions are from the Applying UML and Patterns book, so you can look them up. Uh, most of the questions are also in Swedish, which is probably not that uh, understandable to some of you. But uh, don't fret, the, uh, the uh, real exam will be in English. So uh, just do this as a way to try out the system so that you know how it kind of like works. And let me know if there are any problems. All right, uh, last week we talked about uh, the gang of four patterns. Uh, <coughs> These are maybe a little bit more specific. You have a more specific structure, especially compared to the last of the grasp patterns that were more or less uh, principles or general uh, approaches to, to do stuff, like uh, use polymorphism in direction and so on and so forth. And I think we kind of like left off discussing the visitor pattern and uh, we did not have time to um, to do any uh, implementation of it. But the, uh, the structure of the visitor looks something like this. Uh, and the idea is to add the accept method to the element hierarchy. And this method will call um, the visit element B or visit element A depending on, should probably be a, an A there, should, depending on which class actually implements the element interface and you can do stuff in different types of concrete visitors. Uh, maybe this does not really uh, help you that much. So, I've added some code. If you remember, we had our uh, hierarchy with the get area function and this is our element hierarchy in the visitor pattern so we add the accept operation to it and it accepts a visitor that is also an interface this interface looks like this it has operations for 
each and every type of uh, uh, element in our element hierarchy. And if you may remember, we had the circle and the rectangle and also the composite. And as the composite is uh, a little bit special, I opted to add two functions for it. So the visitor will get a notification that a composite is visited. And this notification will be before or the, all the sh child elements in the composite is visited. And also one uh, operation for after. Depending on how you want things to, uh, what you would like to do in your visitors, you, you, you can do this in slightly different ways. But basically, at least one function per uh, element in your hierarchy. So, for the circle then, it needs to implement the accept function, accept the visitor, and this visitor is uh, then notified that it's a circle that's visited. And respectively for the rectangle, it tells the visitor that a rectangle is visited. And for the composite, <coughs> it accepts a visitor and we have the message that before the children is visited, we can visit the composite and then we accept the visitor for all the children. And then we can visit the composite once more, but afterwards. So, to uh, make an example out of this, I uh, added a concrete implementation of the iShape visitor interface that I called shape printer visitor. And this visitor would like to print the uh, areas of the uh, rectangle circles and the uh, group uh, stuff. And it would like to do so in uh, some kind of formatted way. So we have some tabs and stuff for groups. And basically, when a rectangle is visited, we print that the rectangle area is uh, a certain area. And when a circle is visited, we, we print like a circle area is this. And when a composite is visited, when we print the total group area and also then the composite part. And during this time, we also increment the tab count so that we get an in indentation uh, that is nice. And in the program, we have the uh, hierarchy here uh, as before, but we can now create a new visitor and we just plug this visitor into uh, the composite uh, and things will work. And this is the old printout of the area. And here we had actually no way of trying to know what this is without using some kind of type casting or asking the object what the, what the type it is. So that would not be good. But using the visitor pattern, we can, can add functionality into the uh, program seamlessly. So if I would like to have some other type of printer, I can implement this. So let's do a test run. And this is the original printout from this print area function. And from the visitor printout, we first visit the, the composite, get the total area printout, and then we visit the composite parts, the circle, and the rectangle. And as you can see, they are nicely tabbed. And if we would add more composites to this, it, it all everything would work out. Questions? Nothing? Good. Uh, so using the visitor, we can plug in functionality into an object hierarchy that uh, maybe we cannot change it or we don't, would not like to change it for some reason. Uh, instead, we use the visitor uh, pattern to do this. This code is available on GitHub also. So I would uh, suggest you try it out make some experiments with it and uh, 
find out how it works. Maybe we have a question in the chat. Is it possible to use system out if we are using this as a pattern in model? Uh, no. Uh, you can, of course, add the, if, if you look at the arrows, the dependencies, uh, we could, uh, of course, have circle in the model, no strange print out here, composites, no strange print out here, eye shape, of course, uh, we can have the interface for the visitor in the model also, but the concrete and rectangle, of course, also in the model, but this implementation, where should it be? We cannot put it in the model since it has output in it. So right now, I would suggest that the shape printer visitor implementation should be a view. So, uh, and th this is actually an, an interesting question because um, you can do these, these uh, interesting things with these patterns often that you have the structure or, or the uh, uh, interfaces in the model, but you do the concrete implementations in, in the view or in the controller and you can use this to plug in the uh, functionality into the model without adding dependencies from the model to the uh, uh, console out or, or what it, system out in, in this case. And it's, uh, if you remember back, way back, it's kind of like the same thing with the observer pattern when we use that for uh, sending messages from something that has happened inside the model to the controller. We had put the interface of the, uh, the observer interface inside the model because the model needs to have uh, a collection of uh, subscribers, but the concrete subscriber was the controller actually. So this is perfectly fine, but uh, you need to of course watch out so you in this case would not put shape printer visitor inside the model package. Good. Any other questions? Great, so uh, last topic actually, we, we, I think we have talked about the visitor uh, last time, so I guess that's it. So uh, let's bring this one into view. Last topic, object-oriented design principles and uh, hopefully you will see that these uh, solid principles are actually stuff that we have been talking about more or less explicitly and all the patterns that we have been talking about in some way try to capture the, the knowledge in the solid uh, um, in the solid stack so to speak. So um, in the book, he does not explicitly speak so much about solid and there's no real chapter about it. So I'm putting some, uh, some links up here for you to check out. And probably this one is, uh, oh, has moved. So I will check those links out for you uh, and fix them. Instead. Um, all right, I will get my slides also.
find the slides there. First, posted it in the chat, so you can take a look at it. I will post it on the homepage also. So, solid. Uh, single responsibility, open closed principle, disk of substitution principle, interface segregation, and dependency inversion principle. So these are the some of the at least of the more famous principles in object-oriented design. And you can kind of like take many of them also to other types of uh, types of methods to design and, and program actually. Uh, Single responsibility, for example, could, could very well be, be uh, applied in uh, a more functional programming lang language or procedural programming language. And for example, the uh, clean coding principle is, uh, the clean coding methodology, I should say, is uh, quite uh, inspired at least by single responsibility. Principle. So, single responsibility. There should only be one reason for a class to change. So, this is something that we can, can uh, for example, find in supported by the uh, information expert pattern. And we have been kind of like trying to uh, fix our design in, in the blackjack game so that this is uh, something that we have been thinking about at least. We have the cohesion pattern also that says that, well, you should uh, have the attributes of a class should be used in every uh, operation of the class, uh, almost at least. So when we change something, there should only be one reason for a class to change. So we should not have these uh, um, unrelated changes spreading out all over our application. For example, if I would like to change the user interface, I should not need to change stuff in the model. So that's the basic principle in our model view separation principle. So user interfaces change a lot. You should put this, this responsibility inside some user interface um, package and when the user interface changes, I should change that and not the business rules. This is um, not always that easy to spot if, if a class has more than one responsibility, uh, but we can kind of measure it. And this is lack of uh, cohesion of methods. And basically, we would like to uh, Take the ratio of combinations of operations and attributes and the maximum number of com combinations. Higher is better. So the formula is like this. Here I have one. one minus the combination of operations and attributes that actually exist minus the maximum number of combinations that can exist. So in the best of worlds, this will be one, and you will get an outcome of zero. So if we have the, the, uh, so the combination of operation and attributes sum up to the maximum number of combinations that we can have, we will get uh, zero for the outcome. So O is the number of operations, A is the number of attributes, and this is just a multiplication. And sum OA is the sum of all operations using a particular attribute over all attributes. So we take every attribute, just count where every method where it's used, and we do this for every attribute in the uh, class, and we get the sum. So an example. So we have our circle class here. Uh, if you remember back, we have uh, our uh, radius and our nice mathematical circle class. Uh, so in the constructor we use it, in the get area we use it, in the get circumference we use it, and in the get radius we use the, the radius, of course. So the sum here would be uh, the number of operations is 1, 2, 3, 4. The sum OA would be 1, 2, 3, 4. 
and 1 times 4 is 4, so we would have the lack of cohesion of uh, operations to be, of methods, to be 0. So, and this is good. The radius operation uh, attribute is used in every operation in this class. Note my pedagogical use of background color. So, then we have the a little bit more bloated uh, circle class. If you remember, we added some attributes to uh, uh, handle rendering and stuff like this. And in this example, I just added the position. So, in the constructor, we add the radius and the position. Uh, and we have this draw function that uses the position and the radius. And then we have the usual mathematical functions that do not use the position. So, in this case, we have five operations, two attributes. The radius is used in all five, but the position is only used in two. It's only used in the constructor and in the draw, not in these three. So, the sum is seven. And then we have seven divided by ten, and we get 0 0.3 for the lack of cohesion of methods method. And this is worse, of course, than 0. So using metrics, we, you can uh, get measurements on your code, and you can see, for example, if you compare these two, uh, these two ways to do things, this should show you that this last design here is not as good as the first one regarding uh, single responsibility principle. And more exactly, it's less cohesive. This is something that can, of course, be uh, uh, hard to do in a design, pre-design implementation situation, because you kind of like need the implementation to see, to make the metric calculations. So you have already done your, your design but it can at least guide you into a refactoring. All right, next principle, open closed principle. Maybe this is something that you have heard that a class or system or subsystem should be open for extension, but closed to modification. So we should not need to uh, change our existing classes when we would like to add some functionality. That is at least the goal. So we would like to change behavior of our application without changing the code. Uh, for example, the dealer can have different behaviors, rules, without changing the code in the dealer. And this was one of our goals of using the strategy pattern. We would like to be able to plug in different kinds of um, rules for starting the game, for uh, handling the uh, uh, who won the game, uh, for handling when, how the dealer should take cards when it was uh, the dealer's turn to, to do so. So we would like to be able to change the behavior of the dealer without uh, changing the code in the dealer. Because changing tested and or deployed code is always a risk. If we make some changes in the dealer class, we need to retest it. And this can, of course, be problematic if running test cases manually takes a lot of time and effort. Automatic test cases can also take a lot of time and effort in large systems. So, Trying to minimize the impact uh, of, of changes in uh, existing code is always a good thing. However, uh, it is quite impossible to do this for everything. So you often need to kind of like pick the spots in your application where you think there will be a lot of change or you need to uh, somehow find out that, okay, these parts have actually changed over the last sprints in our, in our 
<coughs> project, so we probably need to uh, make some uh, refactoring or something like that to handle these changes uh, without doing extreme modifications. And we have the protected variations uh, in GRASP and the indirection patterns in GRASP also to, to uh, make this a little bit more specific. But the idea is that you should be able to extend stuff, uh, change the behavior without uh, changing the code. Uh, the next principle, list code substitution principle, it's about subclasses. And it says that subclasses must conform to the behavior clients expect from base classes. So we, we need to, when we, when we do a subclass, we need to make sure that it does not violate the behavior of the, that the clients expect. And this can be sometimes quite tricky actually, because as humans we are used to thinking in these kind of like generalization and specialization hierarchies quite easily. But in reality, it's not that clear cut. And if you remember, we have the polymorphism, the 100% rule, and the is a rule for uh, testing this stuff. And they all tie into the list of substitution principle. So I think we have a small example here. So imagine we have this rectangle class. It has a width and a height. Uh, and it has a get area function. It also has getters and setters for the width and height. Then we come up with a, with a square type. We need a square in our application. And the rectangle seems like a suitable choice to uh, to has, have as a parent for, for the, the square. It, after all, the square is just a special type of rectangle, right? Seems to, uh, seems to work out. And we have the uh, uh, added or modified functionality that, that when we set the width, well, we make sure that the height is also set to uh, the same thing so that the square is still a square. However, we can now imagine this uh, small test case to test the rectangle. So when we test the rectangle, we set the width and we set the height. I think it should say set height here. So we, sh we then add the assert that, well, the, the rectangle uh, area should be 20 in this case, because I set the width to 4 and set the height to 5. Seems to be a solid test case. However, if we plug in a square here, the area will actually be 25, because we have called this function first, or last. And it will also set the height. in the square class. So this test case will break. So we have some unexpected behavior that in the square class, when we set the width, we also set the height. And this is not something that the clients expect. And if we go back, actually we kind of like violated the 100% rule here a little bit. Because the uh, square does not really use 100% of the, of the rectangle class. It uses only one of the values, the width or the height. And setting width and height on a Square is kind of wonky. It does not really map out really well. 
Um, possibly a square has a side instead, a side length or something like that. So this inheritance did not abide by the list of substitution principle. We could not substitute the, uh, the uh, square and direct for all clients that we could come up with. For example, this simple test case. And we all kind of like need to take care when we do these uh, generalization and specialization hierarchies. And if you think back, we actually did not use them that much when we designed our blackjack game. Rather, we used it as a way to minimize code duplication. If you remember, we had the uh, dealer and the player separated <coughs> from the onset. <coughs> and we found that, OK, we have the same types of attributes and some of the same functionality. And then we, then we could use inheritance. So, but you need to take care when you do, uh, when you use the uh, inheritance uh, stuff, especially if you do it in a pre-designed situation, because then it, it's quite easy to run into problems with like this. So, if you devise um, intricate inheritance hierarchies, before you have actually coded anything, uh, you are taking a, a little bit of a risk. I think we can manage possibly to talk about this also before the break. Interface segregation principle. Clients should not be forced to depend on interfaces they do not use. Avoid fat interfaces. So, <clears throat> uh, we have touched upon this uh, in in some of the uh, uh, in s some of the lectures in the blackjack game. I've been talking a little bit about that. Well, it's not good for uh, if we expose too much to the uh, controller, for example. Oh, we send in both the dealer and the player objects into the to the uh, play game operation, and the dealer can actually do a lot, lot more than, than needed with these objects. So we are exposing the, the uh, controller to a larger than interface than, than it actually needs. And then we did the, the facade to minimize this interface to, to something that was actually uh, needed for the uh, controller. And we could see that, well, it, it actually makes it, it easier for the, uh, the, imp the person to imp that implements the controller to actually make the right decisions. It does not have multiple ways to do, do uh, uh, stuff. But there is uh, also other reasons to, to do this, to have as narrow interfaces as possible and avoid these fat interfaces that can do anything. So, uh, if you have some clients that want different stuff from, the, from an interface, different types of uh, clients would like different types of functionality in the interface. So, if a client was, if you have this fat interface, uh, a client wants something new and you add it and, uh, to the interface, and now suddenly all the clients need to be, uh, be updated. So, and this of course is one, changes in one part of the program should not force changes upon other unrelated parts. <clears throat> and also this is, has something to do with interface pollution that subclass responsibilities has a tendency to rise upwards in the, the interface. And you, you sometimes have um, more or less void implementations in 80% of your subclasses. But, and it's only kind of like one class that really implements the functionality. So this is something to watch out for also. And the example is something like this. Uh, we can imagine uh, a uh, automatic teller machine. That is, you, you go and you can withdraw money from it. 
and you can transfer money between your different accounts and you can also put some money into the machine and it will be deposited to your account. And we can see that we have a controller to manage this and we have uh, three subcontrollers. One controller to, to handle uh, transfers, one to handle withdrawals and one to handle deposits. And they all depend on a large user interface, a big interface here. Uh, with the operations for the deposit, the operations for the transactions, and the operations for the withdrawal. And then we have some implementations of the user interface. For example, we can have a speech, um, a speech system so that it uh, can, for, for blind people, can hear what, what the teller is, is, what's happening. And we have, can have a, a usual screen uh, user interface, and we can also have a Braille user interface, for example, for uh, for blind people also. Um, so, when any of these, uh, for example, if we make some modifications in, in the transaction user interface, we would need to update the user interface interface, and suddenly this would need to be implemented in the Braille, and in the screen and in the speech. But also, when this interface updates, the withdrawal transaction type is dependent on this interface. So potentially this also needs to be recompiled, retested, uh, and so on and so forth. Because something has changed, changed in the interface that the withdrawal transaction is dependent upon, but actually it's only this transfer uh, controller that needs these changes. So changes spread because of this fat interface that many clients depend upon. So the good, the better way to do it is then of course to uh, have a separate interface for all of these uh, controllers. So that the transfer interface has an interface for the transfer user interface, and withdrawal has a separate interface for withdrawal functionality, and deposit for deposit functionality. And of course, the concrete uh, subtypes need to implement these interfaces, but if the trans transaction controller needs some change, it will be localized to this part. It will not spread to the withdrawal and the deposit types also. And this is uh, what we would like to achieve. Because if we make a change in, in transfer transaction, we should not need to change deposit transaction controller suddenly, if they are totally unrelated. And we can do this by, by making sure that we do not add fat interfaces to, to our clients. And this is something that actually is quite easy to do. And it creeps up on you. Because when you, when you code, it's much easier to just add the, an operation to an existing interface than to start adding a new interface. So slowly but surely, it kind of like creeps stuff creeps into your interfaces because of you, your convenience when, when programming. And this is something to uh, look out for. All right, I think it's time to take a break. So any questions so far? Good, I will try to get a hold of the new links for the uh, extra information during the break. All right, so we take 15 minutes of a break then.